By way of introduction, I am Eric Shing. I'm a professor of machine learning in the School of Computer Science. Uh, I've been teaching this class for many, many years since uh, the first version of it in 2004. So that's like 14 years ago. But this class has been evolving a lot and uh, with many new topics that uh, I could, uh, ha couldn't have uh, thought about you know, when I started this class, such as uh, like deep learning and uh, many other uh, new trends you know, in the domain. Uh, so, for that sake, uh, the courses are evolving continuously and every year we choose to add some new materials and also try to uh, also make explicit the connections of uh, uh, new materials to the history and sometimes to, uh, to maybe clarify uh, missing connections uh, that people do not realize. Uh, as you all know, uh, I've been on sabbatical for quite a while, uh, working on a startup. Uh, but I also feel very excited uh, to uh, come back to the classroom and uh, start uh, teaching this class again. Uh, as a matter of fact, you know, I haven't taught this class for a while. Uh, if I fumbled, if I uh, couldn't uh, uh, catch up with the latest piece of knowledge, or if I don't know uh, the answer to a few difficult questions, uh, please bear with me and give me some time. I'm going to go home and do my homework and uh, discover those answers and hopefully try to get back to you. Okay. And also, uh, maybe uh, let me get started by making a few standard uh, logistic uh, statements about the class and along the way introduce uh, my colleagues, uh, TAs, uh, who are helping with the class. And then we're going to have a soft start. Today will be rather entertainable, entertaining and also uh, light. Uh, but uh, we're going to ramp up very quickly starting day, one, day two. And uh, hopefully I don't lose all of you okay, in, the, in the next few days. So uh, probabilistic graphic models. The logistics can be actually all found in this web page. Have you guys all been to this page already? You will find literally everything okay, from there. The, the slide deck, the video, and uh, in fact, we are going to do some uh, description of the lecture notes, which will be also helpful for you to review. And also reading materials. There will be a lot of reading materials, optional, but uh, I highly encourage you to read. And uh, here are the basic information. There isn't really a textbook that is uh, mandatory for the class because uh, the material has been really evolving you know, uh, every day. And uh, I put two books there. One is from Daphne Kohler and the Neil Freeman, which is a uh, official published book. Um, but it was written almost 10 years ago. You can imagine that many of the materials are, uh, are not up to date, but it's a great book. It gives you a lot of foundational knowledge about uh, what this topic is about. The other book is uh, Michael Jordan's uh, Probabilistic Graphic Models. That was written even earlier when I was a grad student. But I still find every time I read it very refreshing because it's beautifully uh, presenting you a very intuitive and uh, simple uh, you know, uh, foundation to uh, uh, connect many different parts in the topic of graphical models. And the language is more accessible. Is my voice accessible? Yeah, I'll just make okay. it. Okay. Um, and uh, so these two, I believe, I believe there are online copies of this. If you cannot find it, I can ask the TAs to post it. Uh, they are very, very good uh, reading materials. Maybe the Michael Jordan one is a little bit easier. Uh, Daphne Kohler's and Neil Freeman's book is uh, a little bit uh, intense and dense to read, uh, but uh, I think you can use them as reference point. Of course, when we drive uh, into the uh, more modern topics in graphical models, uh, uh, many of the materials cannot be found there. <coughs> We're going to post papers and uh, tutorials and uh, other materials. Uh, mailing lists are posted here. You can ask questions, you know, by writing to uh, the TAs and instructors, or you can. I encourage you to go to Piazza to actually start the discussions over there. We have uh, five TAs, uh, you know, helping with the class. Are they all here? Maybe we can do a uh, name call so that you can stand up and let people know you. Uh, the head here is Morion. He's right over there. Okay, and uh, well, why don't you say one word, uh, maybe one sentence about what you do <laughs> in research so that they know how to ask you questions. So, uh, my name is Eric. I'm uh, in the research on 
got two models in the work. So the other one is under the ICU. Okay, he is very, you, you probably can hardly hear him. Let me repeat, you know, he does uh, graphic model and deep learning research and uh, also in uh, interpretable machine learning and deep learning. Uh, the second one is uh, Lisa. Lisa probably is not in town yet. Uh, she is still traveling. Uh, she does also a lot of cool stuff uh, in uh, reinforcement learning with applications to game playing and other topics. Uh, the third one is Xun. Uh, I work with Eric and I work on more classical side of uh, well, classical side, you will find out what does it mean by classical side. <laughs> he proves theorems, okay, and establish uh, a lot of guarantees on many of the fancy algorithms that people see. Uh, how is how here? Okay, he is not here. Uh, and he was also, he is also my student. Uh, he does, uh, 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 the topic that uh, bridges uh, machine learning algorithmic and theory research to system research. He actually designs you know, computer systems and architects uh, to run scalable machine learning models. So that's actually one of the interesting directions nowadays that called SysML. Uh, lastly but not least, Paul. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Paul. I work with LP Morrissey and Ross on multimodal machine learning and its applications to NLP visionary. Great, thank you. And you can see we have a great collection of TAs uh, who worked on uh, a wide range of different topics. They each are a domain expert, one of the uh, leaders in, in the research, and they are very knowledgeable, and they can hopefully back up me when I run into questions that I could not answer. And uh, in fact, uh, not, I'm not the only lecturer here. We are going to have uh, uh, a few of uh, guest lectures. I couldn't, uh, okay. Oops. Okay, this pen is not working, but fine. Today I don't need a pen, I will going to work it out. I usually uh, do uh, a lot of uh, uh, pen annotations uh, to derive a few equations or to make a few points, but hopefully today I don't need that. And uh, uh, the class assistant is Amy, who has been working with me also for a long time. If you have a logistic questions, say late homeworks, uh, you know, uh, scheduling special appointments and so forth, you can go to him. And we are going to use Piazza to uh, carry out online discussions. And uh, more logistics, uh, here are uh, the tips about, uh, about uh, how you can get a, a A plus or a good score that you want to, okay? There are four sets of homeworks, which uh, will be non-trivial. We meant to uh, combine, uh, you know, uh, theory questions plus program questions to help you digesting and remembering and uh, practicing the materials taught in the class. And uh, one other uh, thing, I don't know how much you have experienced past, is uh, the script notes. Okay, because we're going to uh, really have a lot of uh, discussions and, uh, uh, and uh, uh, impromptu, uh, uh, you know, uh, spontaneous uh, comments and, uh, and uh, analysis in the class, uh, which are not appearing in the uh, slides. Uh, we're going to uh, each time, each class, invite uh, two to three uh, students to jointly work on a scribe notes, okay? Uh, in fact, we have uh, scribers for today. Oh, we don't. I tell you what, you know, the first class is usually the easiest because you don't have to type too many equations. <laughs> and uh, and uh, we're going to only talk about uh, some very, very uh, uh, superficial and uh, high level topics. Uh, and the, the later you scribe, the harder because you have to uh, understand really, work really hard to understand the materials. So I highly recommend you to, uh, uh, to talk to our TAs to uh, enlist you in the scriber uh, list. And then uh, we're going to, in fact, there is a, a, a credit associated with that. You are going to have 10% of your credit from uh, 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 the scribe notes. So uh, you can, maybe you don't have, uh, if, do we want to raise your hand now? I, I fear I will see 10 hands, then we'll have, we'll have to do a, a poll or a, a draw. Yeah, 
why don't you write to, to uh, the TAs now? And uh, then maybe they will take the first three or whatever <laughs> to be the scriber today, okay? Class participations, I just explained. There are various different ways to encourage uh, participation, and you are going to be rewarded with credits. And uh, the most important thing is uh, the final projects. We are going to take it very seriously that uh, every uh, student uh, should uh, try to find uh, uh, your colleagues to form a team. Usually we see three person to be the ideal size of a team uh, to uh, uh, do uh, a, uh, almost a conference research type of project uh, using the knowledge that you learned from uh, uh, the project. Here I have some examples of uh, such topics. Uh, I'm not going to read them. You can go uh, read them uh, more carefully after class. Uh, in fact, uh, in the past, uh, the class project has been one of the most rewarding part uh, from uh, this class. Many, many uh, uh, students, including nowadays uh, famous professors in different places, had their first paper published in this class including I myself, okay, I took my, uh, my, my graphical models many, many years ago, and uh, my highest cited paper still was uh, the one I published, uh, uh, you know, in this class many years ago. That was my first publication. And also, there are many award-winning papers uh, produced from this class. So do take it seriously and uh, form your team early and decide on topics early. You are going to get, uh, you know, a lot of uh, supports from our TA and myself in uh, helping you determining the, uh, the feasibility, the degree of interest, potential of the topics, and also give you feedbacks. And uh, I encourage you to explore that. We are thinking about having a prize for the best participants of the papers in the end, but the logistics will be announced later because we haven't figured out yet how to do that. And also maybe there are interesting practice you can do. Uh, uh, you probably heard about this uh, system called peer review system in conferences. And uh, we may want to even uh, think about uh, uh, doing a uh, mini uh, peer review practice in, uh, in this class so that uh, we can really uh, you know, try to uh, have a taste about uh, how a real academic conference looks like. And I can tell you, in the past, the workshop at the end of the class presenting all these papers are usually better than many of the formal academic workshops or conferences I went to, okay? And that's because you guys are CMU students, and uh, you know, this topic is also very, very uh, interesting and uh, deep. It does give you the opportunity to do some of the state of the uh, statement of art work you know, in, in the project. Okay, now let's get started. Uh, what are graphical models, okay? So, um, Typically, when we do machine learning, you know, we care about uh, two things. One is that you are given a data set like this. It's a shame I couldn't use a pen. Like this, which uh, are following certain statistical assumptions. And typically, one assumption is that uh, they are ID, identically and independently distributed, meaning that uh, they are drawn from one identical hidden distribution that you may not know, okay? And uh, how to describe that distribution? Well, typically you write down a model. And if the model has a subscript G, which means a graph, that could be a graphical model. I'm going to be more explicit about uh, what that G should look like. For example, uh, here is a graph, okay? And it's a graph uh, with a story behind it. And I'm gonna tell you how this graph can uniquely and uh, uh, consistently specify a model, and then in what condition you can estimate such a model, you know, including the topology and also the parameterization from those data. That's basically what this class is all about. And we're going to be uh, very, very uh, open about, uh, you know, what this uh, graph look like, and uh, what the uh, scoring function could be introduced and uh, what method that we're going to use. In fact, if you think about it, a, a neural network is also a graphical model because uh, you use a graph, right, to help you define, you know, a mathematical function. And uh, there has been a, a lot of, uh, uh, you know, uh, applications and needs for this type of task that we're going to discuss in this class, which is about uh, 
reasoning under uncertainty. Well, probabilistic graphic model is uh, for us to define a uh, probabilistic distribution over data with a complex structure. And the, the application of uh, such uh, a uh, model is for you to do reasoning under uncertainty. So this is different from uh, the, uh, another branch of AI, which is a uh, rule-based logical inference. Uh, where you can basically do inductive reasoning by sequentially apply rules one after another, but uh, without uh, necessarily introducing distributions and the uncertainties and noises. And in here, uh, we are focusing on the other side of the inferential world, where your data are noisy, your knowledge can be uncertain, and also your algorithm may not uh, work ideally to get you the information out of the data. And with all that situation, you have to you know, take into consideration uh, chance or probability. And a graphic model actually will give you a systematic way of uh, carrying out reasoning and uncertainty. And here I show you just a few instances of where such application uh, can be found. And we're going to review some of them very explicitly. Okay, so uh, now it gets a little bit more formal. Uh, what are the fundamental questions typically people worry about as a researcher you know, in uh, graphical models? Okay, uh, so here are the three main set of questions. The first one is about uh, representation. Okay, so how to express the possible world using a mathematical model, you know, hopefully aided by a graph? and how to also uh, encode domain knowledges in such a model. So one is from maybe data and the observation from the real world, the other may be from uh, human knowledge, but they all need to be articulated in a way that machine understands and mathematically consistent. Meaning that uh, if two people you know, uh, has the same data set or has the same set of knowledges, they're going to converge at the same model rather than having their different ways of uh, you know, getting inconsistent models. So that's an a, a important uh, question to ask in representation. And then once you have that model, you can perform inference. Okay? And inference uh, is about uh, you know, uh, maybe making, making predictions or making estimations about certain things that is uh, typically unknown but you want to know. And uh, statistically or mathematically, you can express that uh, you know, by maybe uh, computing this particular query, the probability of uh, a random variable given some data. Okay, that data could be uh, you know, a subset of uh, additional evidence or histories of this data in the past and so forth. And uh, by having a model that is properly represented, you are able to do this uh, not only uh, uh, you know, uh, correctly, but also computationally feasibly, because there are many inference problems that could uh, be as hard as uh, enumerating all the possible facts, and that's typically known as an NP-hard problem. That's usually computationally impossible, even though theoretically uh, that's uh, potentially even uh, a valid question. And then finally, there is also this question about learning. Where do you uh, get uh, the right model from your data. And uh, mathematically, we use this expression where you want to you know, combine your data and the uh, model uh, in some uh, mathematical function, uh, and then you know, which uh, uh, defines you know, some kind of uh, score over all possible ways you can specify the model. And then you're going to pick uh, the optimal one. The optimality is uh, determined by a numerical score that you can compare. Right? So just using this as an example to map them. So here we start from data, which can be images. And the representation basically means that uh, you are going to represent the model in some uh, kind of uh, a reasonable and uh, justifiable way. For example, in biology, people typically use uh, a uh, a genealogy or evolutionary tree to connect different uh, uh, data from different species. But then you can immediately realize that there isn't only one representation, right? There could be this representation, and there could be this representation. 
then you have to have a way to judge which one is better, right? And uh, so how do we judge? Well, we judge by inspection right now. We can look at these two trees, and uh, I bet you, you know how to tell, right, which one is better. And uh, in your brain, you're actually already running a loss function because uh, you may be calculating uh, some level of alignment. Maybe uh, the amount of uh, distortion you could result in you know, by uh, following this uh, tree structure to compute uh, the pairwise distances you know, uh, of uh, two nodes between, you know, underneath uh, a common internal leaf. Right? And uh, biologically, people could mathematically express that by, for example, taking DNAs out of these guys and then do an alignment and uh, quantify the differences between them and then calculate a tree that gives us the least discrepancy okay, in terms of uh, distances. And then you can also have uh, additional representations, which uh, in this case is called uh, hidden nodes or hidden random variables, which uh, could be of uh, a uh, uh, hypothetical or even practical interest. For example, in here, a hidden node may correspond to you know, the ancestor that you have never run into, but they do exist in the past and want to do uh, an inference about that. And by introducing these uh, hidden nodes, you now have a placeholder to attribute value to. And that allows you to write down this uh, inference problem mathematically very explicitly, right? rather than making a guess. And that basically is already giving you a graphic model. Okay, once you walk through the representation, the inference and learning, just uh, you know, at a very high level, you already intuitively have a graphic model in your mind, which has uh, observation data, hidden states, structures, and in fact, you need to learn some uh, numbers, which uh, helps you to define the probabilities of the real data, which is actually a, 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 a open topic we're going to discuss for the rest of the class. Okay, so why graphic models? Uh, we have probability. We've all learned probability before. You know why uh, today uh, we are going to uh, open this uh, very special topic called the uh, graphical models. You know, models and the graphic models. What's the difference between them? And uh, why, why graphic becomes so interesting? So now let's look at uh, a model. Okay, just a generic model without referring the word to the word graph. Okay. So we have uh, a few random variables. Here we have eight. And uh, we can always uh, write down a joint distribution over arbitrary number of random variables. And uh, here is a joint distribution of eight random variables. Okay. So that's basically a model. It's a joint distribution of uh, n random variables. How do we typically uh, express such a distribution? Anybody want to make a suggestion? When you have a, a uh, collection of random variables, and, uh, and then you uh, want to write down a, and assuming that all these random variables are discrete, maybe just binary, and I ask you to write down a joint distribution of that, what does that distribution look like? Well, you are thinking, let me give it a try and see whether I can still uh, bring up the pen, because I really like the pen function. Mm -hmm. Any questions? <coughs> What's that? Uh, you can make any assumption. Yeah, let's say they are independent. Yeah. Okay, I got my cam back. Thank you for <laughs> holding off the time. Yeah, <laughs> and your 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 and and your 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 answer is also great. Okay, you are you are you are getting where I'm getting to. So what we want is uh, basically a distribution, and assuming they are independent, and uh, we basically need to put a number here. So let's say x one 
x2 all the way down to x8. And uh, then, you know, uh, basically, if uh, we have uh, uh, all the zeros in here, that's an event for this eight random variable. And we need to put a number here, which is, uh, say, p1, right? And then there's another event, maybe put a 1 here, and the p2, right? I think that's a rational way, maybe the correct way that you need to specify a, uh, uh, a full joint distribution of all random variables, OK? And of course, uh, there are many, many such rows out there. How many rows we have to specify? Two to the number of eight, right? Minus one, maybe. If uh, it's a probability, they have to sum to one. So there is a le one less degree of freedom. OK, so a lot of rows. Now, imagine if you have uh, 100 random variables, maybe a 1,000. Can you find a computer to store all these probabilities? 2 to the power of 1,000, what's that number? Well, at some point, you will be running out of uh, your memory. In fact, uh, you will be uh, having so many states that they are more than the total number of particles in the universe. OK, you have no way to store them. So in a way, this is a conceptual expression. and. Uh, if you are a computer scientist, you worry about actually indexing this table and search it and compute it. Uh, this, uh, this way is questionable. It's not scalable in our world. Okay? And of course, uh, where to get all this number is uh, not even a question yet, because uh, the numbers has to reflect truth. Therefore, you have to collect all the data and uh, estimate uh, uh, their frequency. Okay, that's basically a, a learning question. And um, in fact, uh, if you have too many random variables, uh, in your lifetime, you may never see all the configurations show up at least once. Therefore, some of the probabilities are left uh, uh, unestimatable at some point, right? So that's basically, you know, and of course, the inference, actually, how do we do inference? For example, uh, what's the probability of uh, x1 and the x2 to be both 1? That's a marginal probability of uh, x1 and x2. And how do you do that, do computation of that? Great, thank you. He was saying that uh, you need to basically just look into this table and uh, find all the rows that has uh, the first uh, two columns to be one, and then you'll sum all of that. Okay, you will find many such rows. Therefore, that's uh, another uh, very expensive question. So in a sense, in, you could probably get a, get uh, an intuition or idea. All these questions are NP-hard problems. It really uh, you know, uh, asks you to enumerate all the possible configurations. So computationally, learning and inference you know, with such a representation is uh, not a very scalable idea at all. Okay? And that actually gives you already a hint that uh, a probabilistic distribution without any structure, but just with a table, is uh, not going to be a uh, very, very effective uh, vehicle for you to do real work. Okay? And also, nowadays, we have uh, plenty of domains with uh, more than a thousand random variables. Okay? For example, uh, how many stocks are listed on NASDAQ and Dow Jones? Do you know that? Maybe roughly 20,000, or maybe even more. And uh, let's forget about the numerical value. Just say they are up and down. Okay, and I want to make an investment about uh, you know a portfolio. Okay, that requires you to do this already. Okay, so now maybe uh, let me uh, uh, further uh, push you a little bit. Yeah, you want to model Dow Jones or maybe Nasdaq. That's what, what I'm more familiar with. And uh, yeah, there are a couple of thousand different stocks, but you also know that they are there are industry sectors which are useful information you never. Uh, want to use, for example, how to, you know, Intel and uh, AMD and NVIDIA and uh, their stock uh, very often, not all the time, go together up and down, right? And then, you know, if you look at Facebook and Google and Amazon and Microsoft and those, uh, they are the so-called the, the IT sectors uh, and uh, their stock has a trend. But if you look at uh, McDonald's and uh, Walmart, well, Walmart may be somehow related to Amazon, maybe negatively, I don't know. <laughs> uh, but, but, uh, <laughs> but at least uh, you can get some uh, dependencies already, right? Now, when you are working with this table, do those knowledges uh, you know, having an impact at all in your inference? Maybe not. 
Right. So we ask, how can we make use of this knowledge and uh, to uh, make a better prediction and also to hopefully make a more economical model? Right. So that basically leads to our next uh, question. Why we want to play with uh, graphic models? So again, I start with a word without structure. So here is a word without a structure. But uh, here we have a real word. It is not just eight random variables. These eight random variables have their physical meanings. Okay, I was a biologist, therefore I, uh, I was uh, trying to show you a story that I truly understand with some biological background. Here, every random variable is a molecule in a cellular system. And you have these strange names, well, uh, receptors, which are the guys sitting on top of the cell surface to take signals. And the kinase are the guys uh, who are relaying the signal by generating some chemical reactions and amplify the signal from outside to within. And there are something called the uh, uh, TF, transcription factors, which is uh, taking such, such a signal and uh, trigger the production of a DNA you know, out of a template. And then we have the DNA templates in here, which uh, can be made uh, multiple copies thanks to the work of a transcription factor. Okay, so now I'm a biologist and I tell you this story. And uh, now that you know, there is a way even to write the story in this way. First of all, the molecules uh, belong to different compartments inside the cell. Some are outside of the cell on the membrane, some are inside the cell, and some are inside the nuclear of the cell. And then they have a, a certain pathway that connects who talks to whom. They don't actually talk to each other randomly. The receptor never talks to a gene because there are physical barriers between them. Okay, so this is a, a typical pathway that you can find in many biological books. Okay. Now with this, I can still ask you, do you find it uh, uh, possibly a uh, alternative way of expressing that uh, gigantic table of uh, joint distributions? Like with uh, all the random variables assuming to be independent of each other. Independent means that uh, you need to examine every combinations of configurations together and uh, give them a probability. And uh, non-independence means that uh, some configuration may never happen together because uh, you know, they don't talk to each other and they are physically barred away or so forth. Right? So that's basically you know, uh, where we are trying to get into. So in the later part of this class, I'm going to start from a simple but intuitive rule that offer you the following. Uh, alternative way of defining a graphic model, um, a probabilistic model. Instead of uh, you know, uh, writing down a joint distribution of eight random variables, like in a big table I just show, when given a graph, let's follow a law which is called uh, the factorization law, which actually is a graph traversal algorithm that is unique in that you are going to traverse this graph and whenever you run into a node, you are going to write down a conditional distribution of uh, the random variables you're hitting given their parents. Okay? And if the node does not have a parent, then you write down its marginal probability. And then you multiply them together. Okay? And uh, that's basically a law which allows this uh, uh, joint distribution to be factored into a multiplication of uh, multiple smaller terms, which are either marginals of a single or multiple random variables without parent in the graph, or conditional distributions of a random variable given their parents. Okay, I literally follow the, the, the law I just mentioned. Uh, let's assume this is feasible. We're going to prove why this is correct in the future. Okay, and uh, can people tell me uh, uh, what benefit do you get when I apply this graph and then rewrite the joint distribution into this product, this multiplication. What's the benefit you get? Uh, well, I think now we can store the relations, relations between the variables in a much smaller table. In a much smaller table. That's right. Thank you. For example, you can see, in fact, uh, here I did a little calculation about uh, the number uh, of parameters you need to 
equally parameterize the joint distribution. Here, you need to define what this distribution look like. It requires one number because it is a binary state of a single random variable. And this one requires one number. This one requires how many numbers? Well, conditional distribution of one random variable given another, two numbers. OK, you can tell me why it's not four numbers, right? And in your homework, maybe. And uh, we have also uh, a conditional distribution of uh, one random variable given uh, two parents. And uh, well, that needs four numbers, right? And altogether, you need uh, 18 rather than uh, 2 to the uh, 64 minus 1. OK, that's a huge reduction. If you actually imagine this n to be not 8, but uh, 80, you are going to save even more, I bet you, you know, if uh, you can use the graph. Okay. So intuitively, you already see the first benefit. I'm going to now be able to handle a really, really big multivariate distribution by uh, using uh, the graph structure to factorize my distribution. Okay. And also, this factorized distribution is uh, capturing very intuitively the knowledge already. I'm going to be very explicit about what those knowledge depends, uh, stands for in the next lecture, which are known as a conditional independences given random variables. You can get a whole lot of uh, such independence uh, statements and uh, properties from a graph using some algorithm we're going to talk about. So that's uh, one benefit. You save cost, OK, uh, in uh, representing a complex distribution. And secondly, there are some additional benefits. For example, if we stare at this, uh, now I'm going to show some color in here. What does this color mean? Well, you know, in biology, biology is a big project. In the good old days, uh, multiple laboratories sometimes uh, jointly study a single system, and they divide the work. Uh, some lab is study this uh, uh, four, uh, uh, five molecules, and the other lab study these uh, three molecules, and they use different equipments. And uh, of course, their lab temperatures, everything is different. Therefore, there is uh, a uh, paradigm difference and, uh, uh, in generating the numbers they report in the paper. So uh, how can we combine uh, these two pieces of knowledge together? Do we add them? Do we multiply them? Or do we uh, uh, interpolate them or, or what? Right? So if we look at uh, the form of uh, this joint distribution, you know how to do it. Right? Basically, you know, the joint distribution factors into a product of uh, smaller terms. And each smaller term is uh, self-contained. It's a local conditional distribution you can estimate it from uh, a set set of data. For example, in estimating this little guy, you only need to have data of uh, x8 and x5 and x6. And you don't need to know the, the number of all these other random variables. Therefore, every laboratory could uh, actually estimate uh, their own little conditional distributions based on their own data. And then they just uh, aggregate all this uh, into a center place and multiply. That gives you the joint distribution. Okay? So this uh, data integration possibility is very interesting, which is actually often used right now you know, in designing larger systems and in designing larger uh, distributed intelligence systems. And I gave you a few examples. Just now we saw an example in biology. And uh, you know, in now our uh, world of uh, cell phones, uh, typically every user has uh, text data, image data, and network data, which describes your friendship, your photos, and uh, your emails and text messaging. And uh, in determining what of course, it's a kind of, a, in my opinion, an evil application. But in determining what uh, product uh, to show you uh, at a cost of your privacy, typically those companies are combining all this information together. And uh, one thing to do it is to multiply, basically, a distribution defined on each modality and make them joint okay? using graphical models. They may not realize it or, or, uh, or admitting using graphic models, but uh, the principle remained the same. And in genomics and in biology, in fact, uh, people routinely combine genomic data, proteomic data, and uh, transatomic data, phenome data uh, together. Uh, again, these words are a little bit mysterious, but uh, they represent DNA protein and uh, uh, some other type of protein called uh, uh, RNA, in fact, not, not protein. And the phenome means environments. 
and give you a so-called panomic view of uh, the biology system. Okay, so that's uh, one second application. The third application is, uh, uh, okay, so we, we, we have uh, data fusion as our third advantage. What's the uh, second advantage? What's the third advantage? The third, uh, well, in fact, there are more than three advantages. I'm going to only uh, maybe highlight three to begin with as a teaser. In the future, we're going to see more. So this third one is actually also very, very important. Remember, I said that uh, uh, in many cases, you know a domain uh, that is uh, 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 you know, uh, uh, described by data, but uh, you have additional piece of knowledge which uh, could uh, uh, help uh, further uh, you know, uh, explain or, uh, or uh, understand the domain. For example, uh, um, let's say what, what's the example? Um, say the temperature of the Earth, for example. Um, we probably can have a knowledge that uh, the temperature range is uh, going to be uh, above uh, minus 100 Celsius and below maybe uh, 100 or maybe 200 Celsius. That's kind of the rough range on the surface of the Earth. Well, but uh, when we say that uh, we want to estimate the distribution of temperatures on Earth, if the system does not know that, they are going to start from a minus uh, 273 to, God know, you know, maybe a, few, a, a million <laughs> degrees Celsius, and uh, start, start searching for those data. But uh, if you have that piece of knowledge, which we can call a prior knowledge, you could confine the search. Right? Uh, how to do it formally, mathematically, uh, elegantly, and uh, maybe correctly? Well, one way to do that is uh, to use the bathing theorem. Okay, here is how it looks like. You have uh, data, and you have a hypothesis. And the Bayesian theory says that uh, you can write down a posterior distribution of the hidden variable given the data using this law. Okay, Here you have the likelihood of the data given the hidden variable and the prior probability of the hidden variable. And then here you have the marginal likelihood of the data. Well, let me be very explicit. This actually equals to P of D only by summing out all the hidden variables. OK, so uh, you, you see that this law is very interesting. You know, it first of all allows you to infer what is unknown based on observed data. And secondly, it gives you a placeholder where you can in inject prior knowledges okay, without even seeing any data of the hidden variables. And this is uh, useful you know, uh, for generic uh, probabilistic inference. But in the graphic model, that makes uh, the whole operation Okay, I want to emphasize, it doesn't give you new theory or new uh, you know, uh, uh, power, but it makes you the operation a lot more uh, streamlined and standardized. For example, in here, you know, we have the data and the random variable, and uh, you learn two things. One is the structure, and one is uh, the conditional distribution tables, which are numbers from those. And uh, this is usually you know, through a principle known as the maximum likelihood estimation. But uh, if you do believe that you have uh, even prior knowledges of uh, such a structure and the parameters, then you can basically make the learning like this, such that uh, given the data and the prior knowledge, you can learn a posterior distribution of the structures or of the models, given data and also the prior distribution. And the why you know uh, in graphic model this is uh, a uh, useful uh, kind of uh, uh, function. Well, if we look at the graphic models, originally parameters is hidden and the data is observed. This gives you a two-node graphical model, and uh, now you have a piece of prior knowledge over this uh, hidden random variable. And graphically, all what you meant is to add additional random variables into that, which basically gives you a very universal way of representing the structure of the knowledge, and also, most importantly, the structure of uh, your computation down the road. Imagine that if you have a way to design an algorithm or a mathematical protocol or computation protocol that runs on all graphs, then you can use the same algorithm to infer, you know, uh, to do your inference task, uh, however many other nodes you are going to add onto that, which is not going to change your algorithm. That's actually a very important property we're going to run into in the future. 
Anyway, I'm going to stop bragging about the uh, the nice properties of graphic models. There are a lot of uh, downsides as well we're going to see. But uh, in a nutshell, graphic model is um, a useful tool and also a, uh, a uh, more kind of uh, uh, structured and uh, what's this? Oh my goodness, I'm running out of battery. I have this, don't worry about that. I still couldn't believe it. Let's see why I don't. Okay, I have 10 minutes left. Let me switch uh, a... Uh, That's what you will see in the, typically in the first lecture. Every equipment is not tested yet. Okay. Uh, what should I do? So, so I, said I think so. Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I just want to uh, uh, you know summarize by saying that uh, you know probably graph model is basically nothing but uh, a multiverse statistics plus structures. Okay. Sometimes uh, we in the good old days when the graph model was a fancy term, uh, we see uh, many. Uh, in fact, the same phenomenon happens now as well, but with a different uh, name on that. So in the past, we saw many papers saying that uh, we use uh, graphic models to solve problem A and B and C. Uh, this is uh, you know, a, a very, very uh, uninformed statement, uh, in my opinion, because the graphic models is not really a model. Okay? It is, uh, it's just like we use mathematics to solve problem A, B, C. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> right? So this is just a particular way of doing modeling and uh, doing uh, inference rather than a specific model. Just like nowadays, when you hear words like we use deep learning to solve problem A, B, and C, it doesn't make too much sense. It has to be more specific on which deep learning models and what particular algorithm you use. Right? In fact, even the word probability is uh, sometimes uh, not needed in modern uh, universe of uh, graphic models. For example, we can just uh, uh, replace the probabilistically motivated score function, such as likelihood, with some other loss functions. And uh, you can get uh, what we call a graphical model, uh, which uh, can be handled uh, very often the same way as we deal with uh, graphic models. In fact, the deep neural network is a graphic model because the loss function on top of that is not necessarily a probabilistic loss function. It could be a uh, uh, fitness loss. It could be an adversarial loss. It could be many other uh, you know, uh, fancy combinations of loss functions. But if you just uh, you know, get down to the structure of the mathematical form of those models, you actually will see that they actually represent uh, maybe a uh, new incarnation or maybe a rebranding of uh, what we already see in graphic models or in probabilistic graphic models. And we're going to give you quite a few examples of that so that you can tie together all the knowledges. Okay, so uh, I think I've said enough. What is the graphic models? Okay. Basically, it is uh, really a method for us to write and specify and compose and design exponentially large probabilistic distributions. So it's kind of a plain, uh, modest goal, but uh, you will find it's very important because uh, structuring semantics, you know, which represent a lot of the human knowledge, really can help to, uh, uh, to, to speed up computation and also to simplify you know, the, the computation. And then more formally, it actually represents a uh, family of distributions uh, on a set of random variables which Okay, so here is this uh, very tricky word, which are compatible with uh, all the probabilistic uh, statements that we can make. Okay, on the graph. 
And why this is important? Because uh, by giving you a graph, uh, if we don't define uh, a common rule that we, uh, we all can agree, then people could uh, come up with uh, different uh, uh, outcomes. When we see two nodes, why we multiply them together? Why don't we add them together? This also makes sense, right? At least uh, operationally, I can do addition, division, multiplication, anything. And why I care about the parents? Why, why, why not uh, the probability of uh, the, uh, the parents giving the children rather than the children giving the parents? So all this actually could operationally be implemented if you are just a robot and you don't understand semantics. Therefore, we need to begin by defining a set of uh, semantics that we all agree upon, just like the accents in geometry. Then with that, you are going to be rewarded by a unique way of writing down a distribution given any graph. And then people re start communicate. Basically, you can speak the same language. You talk to a, a non-expert who draw your graph, and the, another expert draw your if the same graph, then the two people will actually meant the same distribution. And there are two types of graphic models, just for your information uh, at this point, uh, which actually uh, are uh, almost completely cover the needs uh, of a common inference tasks in multivariate domain. One is a uh, directed graphic model where a edge has an arrow pointing to from parents to children. And uh, very often people give them some sense of a causality in there. Uh, and the other type of graph model is uh, a undirected graphic model where uh, you typically interpret the edge between two nodes by a correlation type of argument. And uh, here is uh, an example. You know, and uh, these two type of graph models can give you somewhat uh, very different uh, conditional independence uh, uh, interpretations. And just give you a flavor of how they look like, we're going to uh, uh, explain that in more detail in our future lectures. So here is a, a directed graphic model. And uh, what kind of uh, uh, conditional independent uh, meaning that you can extract from it? Well, very magically, you can prove the following facts. If we are given, uh, we are interested in the random variable x, and also you are given some facts, which are the, the green nodes in here, then I can say that uh, the green nodes, uh, the, 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 the yellow nodes x, given all the green nodes y, uh, the conditional distribution of a p of uh, uh, x given y will be the same regardless of uh, all these other random variables okay, in the graph uh, in the, uh, stance. And in another word, we can say that uh, x is uh, conditionally independent of uh, the, the red stuff, given the green stuff. Okay, so this is actually a very, very important property you will find useful in the future, you know, in your computation. Because uh, imagine that you have a social network, and uh, you want to, you have a friend circle like this. And uh, I want to uh, make an estimate of uh, your probability of uh, going to a uh, movie theater or a dinner at a particular time. And uh, you are given all the evidences of uh, your first degree friends, second degree friends, and so on. The truth is that to compute that probability of you doing certain thing, I don't need to look at the activity of uh, many of these members in your network. I only need to look at uh, these neighbors in your network. In this case, which is a directed model, it entails your parents in the graph, your children in the graph, and the children's co-parents in the graph. Okay. So this is a very, very important trick, which can be proven. Basically means that uh, P of uh, X given Y and plus a lot of other things is uh, equivalent to P of uh, X given Y. This can be mathematically proven. Okay. And that's a key property that a graphic model will assure you. And uh, it gives you a lot of computational convenience, okay? Because you don't need to look at all these other numbers that you need, uh, you are given. And also it makes the learning also very easy because uh, when you learn the conditional distribution of this, you don't need all these other evidences either. Okay, so that's a flavor of a Bayesian network or a directed graphic model. And uh, additionally, we have a undirected graphic model 
which have uh, a different semantics, but very, very similar. Here, the graph does not have uh, any uh, directional edges. And then the conditional property, independence property, can be stated as follows. X is uh, independent of the rest of given Y. But if you look at the Y, they are different from uh, the previous graph. They are just the graph neighborhood of this node, not parents, children, and children's co-parent anymore. Okay. Again, you know, you know, it gives you computational convenience and the statistical tightness because uh, you are going to only need a subset of evidence in your entire universe to make a rational inference about yourself. Okay. All right. And uh, in the future, you are going to see a proof of uh, uh, such a, uh, a, uh, a theorem, which is actually very important to guarantee uh, uniqueness and correctness. So from uh, the previous examples, you can see that I give you a graph. And you can just, without a worry about probability and everything, just by using the graph topology, you can extract certain set of uh, conditional independences or relationship between random variables. You can literally use the graph topology to get that, right? So there is a way to define probabilistic distributions uniquely, which is that uh, I'm given all the random variables, and I'm given all the conditional independence properties of the random variables, and I'm going to specify a distribution that satisfies all these. At least hypothetically, this is doable, right? All this is a legitimate task. But uh, can someone suggest me how you are going to do it? I give you just without a graph, I give you a written set of uh, independences, say x independent of y given z, something like that. I give you a lot. And I want you to write down a joint distribution, uh, p of x and y and z, which uh, satisfies all these independences. How are you going to do that? You can't make any assumption. It could be direct could or indirected. How are you going to do that? All uh, the nodes which are independent and uh, uh, do not uh, result as such. Uh, to read up others, they exist as the first nodes to begin with. And then again, for example, let's say x1 and x2 are those things, and we have x2 uh, 25, so x1 and x2, x3, mm -hmm. type of x1, and x2, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. The remaining depends on the entire uh, graph. Like, uh, like. Okay, he said uh, quite a few uh, tricks. And uh, all of them includes uh, edges and the nodes and everything already. You are already thinking in the language of a graph, right? Good. That's actually the right way to go. Uh, what if uh, I don't use any graph? Just uh, mathematically, can I construct such a distribution? Because a joint distribution is a table of eight numbers, right? I can basically just put eight numbers and test whether they pass my independence or not. Right? The joint probability of a two random variable may be a point, uh, 0.64. And uh, then if I write down the marginal to be also 8 and 8, then it means that uh, these two are independent because uh, they multiply and get my 0.64. I can actually try that as well. Right? And uh, that's hard if you have a lot of uh, independences. Right? So what I'm trying to say here is that uh, indeed there are two ways of uh, specifying a distribution. One is to basically identify this uh, independence of the graph exhaustively by a graph traversal or graph analytic algorithm, and then write down the distribution that satisfies that using some kind of testing procedure. The other way is, uh, as what you said, I start to put graphs on top of uh, you know, uh, those uh, uh, dependencies and the random variables. And I'm going to use the graph factorization rule I just mentioned, you know, parents and the conditional of uh, children given parents and so forth, and simply multiply them together. There isn't a proof yet, okay, that these two things are doing the same thing, but there can be proof that uh, these two things are actually doing the same thing. They actually give you the same distribution. That's very important. It means that uh, when you are forgetting about independence and everything, you just blindly follow a graph topology and traversal, you are going to get an algorithm which satisfies all the conditional independence properties of that graph. So this is actually very phenomenal because uh, imagine a big graph that uh, you want the inference to respect all these uh, independences. How can you achieve that? Well, you can achieve that by just starting by with a graphic model that already respects all these independence properties. 
and it can be done very easily by a uh, factorization rule that I just said about. Right? So this is something that one can actually prove. I'm not sure we will prove that or not, but if you are really curious, you can already go to Daphne Kohler's book, and I believe there exists a group. And that's why graphic model is very important, because it really makes your life easy. You don't have to devise you know, very expensive testing scheme to write down you know, uh, complex distributions that satisfy certain properties. You literally just need to write down a graph, which many people are very good at. Okay, in fact, uh, we have originally seen such graphs, although we don't realize that they are you know, members of our graphic model family. A density distribution, which estimated the probability distribution of one random variable, or in the Bayesian setting, giving its prior, is a graph of one node. Okay, and uh, also regression, usually you know, uh, input and response, where the function, the conditional, could be a uh, linear regression function or others, actually is already a small graphic model that uh, people work with, although the graph here isn't helping too much. Right? And the classification, likewise, are similar thing. So I mean, these are small graphs, which in turn, in the future, we'll find can be used as building blocks for larger graphs. And uh, here, you know, there is uh, a uh, diagram made by uh, my, my friend Zubin, which tells you, in fact, uh, how all these different graphic models can be composed and how they are related. You know, uh, this is sometimes known as a graph of graphic models. And uh, why, why it's interesting? Well, we can see that uh, in the past, figuring out inference, you know, in, say, factorial HMM, a mixture of HMM, each of them was actually a NIPS paper, you know, sometimes a winning paper, very, very, very complex. But now if you put the, all this work in the context of uh, inference on general purpose graphic models, you will find that all these principles are pretty trivial, you know, after, you know, in afterthoughts. And there are general purpose algorithms, just like nowadays people do back propagation on deep network, right? They are general purpose, and they actually could blindly work for many different graphical structure. And we're going to see why that's true, you know, using the graphic model vehicle. So let's look at some graphic models that uh, has been designed in the past, thanks to the aid of this uh, graphical aid. It actually allows people to become much more structured, you know, in writing down sensible models. Uh, we know, you know, uh, in Africa, of course, is a very, very, uh, one of the, you know, uh, uh, I have to give Africa a lot of credit for at least bringing awareness of reinforcement learning you know, back to the world of uh, artificial intelligence because that was uh, uh, not very often a very hot topic before its success. Reinforcement learning, in fact, was also used in training you know, mechanical robots, auto self-driving cars, and so forth. And one of the key structure in reinforcement learning is like this. You have a sequence of states which is evolving over time and uh, an action can be made to change the states, and, uh, and then a consequence is resultant from that change, and then you get a reward. You, know, you bump into someone, or you successfully you know, accelerated, or you completed a few mileage without accidents, and so forth. And all this knowledge can be actually represented by a graph like this. And that's actually a graphic model. In fact, uh, in the middle of the class, we're going to uh, have a few lectures uh, telling you how you know, every rules and uh, models used in reinforcement learning can be expressed by a graphical model. And uh, in uh, machine translation, again, you know, you can intuitively come up with a graphic model so with a lot of uh, nuance that helps you to enhance translation. For example, here we have, uh, you can see these are two lists of uh, nodes, which represents two aligned sentences, one, say, from France, French, the other from English. And then, you know, your model wants to force an alignment on them. And then the alignment shouldn't be just verbatimly. They should probably also align on topics that uh, the word not only uh, you know, appear the same, but they also should mean the same, and so forth. So we have a topic representations that you will see in the future, which uh, gives extra credit if the alignment satisfies a topic alignment and so forth. And again, such a complex model is usually uh, becoming intuitive to explain and implement with a graphical model language to design. Genealogy is a natural graph, right? How to specify the relationship between parents and children. And here it's becoming a little bit more interesting because uh, we know 
in every individual, you will have uh, two copies of the DNA material, one from parents and the other from, uh, you know, uh, one from father, the other from mother. Therefore, have two nodes, and then they give rise to yourself, you know, how you look like. And then the way it's inherited is uh, determined by which copy is passing down to the children and so forth. And that complex thing, if you have a few hundred, can be a little bit uh, hairy and messy to describe. Now you write a graph, and you kickstart an inference engine that is uh, generic on this graph. Then you can do all this inference automatically. Okay. So I'm intentionally not giving any deep learning graphic models yet. You are going to see plenty of that in the future. These are places where graphic model also can be very useful without even using deep learning. Mechanical physics, or not actually solid state physics, is another graphic model. How do we describe the energy state of uh, you know, molecules, atoms? You know, like uh, in this, uh, uh, I don't know, the solid chloride or what? I don't know this particular piece of uh, uh, material, but uh, usually it's a lattice structure where the edge is a, a chemical bond which is associated with the energy. And then by modeling the interplay between all these molecules, you can write down the stable state of uh, this piece of metal to determine their melting temperatures and so forth. So there are many applications of graphic models nowadays, which we're going to see a few. And uh, I want to wrap up today's lecture by really reminding you that the graphic model topic is still very fresh and needy and uh, could be very helpful in uh, even uh, propelling uh, modern research such as uh, reinforced learning and deep learning. It's really giving you a uh, mathematically very elegant and uh, simplistic language of uh, communication between different models, between different people. For example, you can bring your graphic models to a biologist, to a chemist, and he actually understands what you do rather than giving him a pile of code or draw a black box 200 layer deep learning algorithm that no one actually know how to debug and interpret. Right? So that's actually one of the very important uh, virtue of uh, a uh, very formal graphic model. And it is actually a language for computation and deployment uh, developments where you can you know, really design principled and uh, universal algorithms for that. And uh, here is uh, some some excerpts I got from Michael Jordan's book, which uh, tells you the connections of uh, graphic models to uh, probabilistic theory, to graph theory, and also many of the other uh, ingredients and uh, developments you know, in modern machine learning community. So just to wrap up, uh, here is the plan for the class. We are going to spend uh, the first uh, maybe uh, say three weeks or two or four weeks to complete the fundamental of the graphic models. Again, we condensed a lot of material because uh, the whole book of Staff Nicola and uh, Neil Freeman is about the foundational. It could be as long as a semester already. We are going to do that in three or four weeks. And uh, why we do that? Because I bet you guys want to catch up with the state of the art research nowadays and people, what people are doing now you know, with uh, new tools such as uh, you know, GAN models, deep generative models, and uh, uh, neural networks, and the uh, reinforcement learning, active learning thing. We are going to now use uh, the bulk of the lecture to cover these uh, advanced topics, but using you know, a uh, universal and the general purpose graphic model language so that we can tie things together and uh, ho hopefully also recognize opportunities out there. And we're going to also provide a few case studies where you can see graphic models uh, are put in action to drive uh, a few specific problems. Uh, okay, uh, I have another five minutes. I, can, I actually have my lecture two already ready. If you prefer, I can start that immediately or I can take some questions from you guys. Today is uh, kind of faster. In the future, I will have uh, in every lecture roughly 80 slides to 100 slides. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to cover all of that. Many of them are appendix, which gives you extra tips and uh, additional information just for fun. You can do it off class uh, to enlarge your knowledge base. Uh, we'll see how far we can go. Any, any questions from the audience? Yes. Uh, the, the scribe duties, is it 
strictly just the slides or is it the readings as well? The summarize? Good question. The, as much as you want. Yeah, and I, I, I have an. <laughs> yeah, you cover the slide. You have the lectures. Yeah, yeah. But if you you get uh, additional materials, even better. Yeah. Any other questions? Okay. Uh, in that case, I'm going to see you on Wednesday. Thank you very much. <laughs>